The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, welcome everybody to Coffee with Coffee. We've got a jam-packed uh, session for you today, and Jody's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting. Uh, my colleague Jody does the engineering training for Coffee, and he's got a really good background for this topic. He's worked for Wiesman, for Amtrol, and a number of other companies. So uh, we're going to take a more scientific look at uh, air problems today, not just you know what a separator is and how it works, but uh, we're going to get into it a little bit deeper. So uh, Jody's going to scroll through here. I'll do a couple of housekeeping slides, and then we're going to jump right into it. We'll try and leave some room at the end for questions and our uh, contest winners and stuff like that, but let's uh, let's roll with it, Jody. Thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, you want that button? Yep, I got that. Yes. Yeah. So today's uh, today's references for what we're doing is uh, it's out of Hydronix 15 mainly. Uh, there's some good stuff in 12, 13, and I probably could have put up about two or three more, but you'll find the air elimination type kind of thing shows up in a lot of different locations. Um, now when we start to talk about it. Uh, Learning about air elimination tends to show up in a lot of different areas, and sometimes it's real hard to gather that information and pull it in. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of things where I picked up, and what's interesting is a lot of times you'll find that you find you learn stuff that really is not presented as a topic, but it starts to roll into it when you learn about other topics. For instance, let's talk about scuba diving. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a young me, myself and my roommate, uh, diving up on Penobscot Bay uh, up in Maine back in the early 80s. And you look at diving and it's like, well, what does really diving have to do with air elimination? One of the things you learn about diving is something called the bends. And the bends are all about gases going into solution in your body as you go deeper. And when you come back up, the gas is coming out of solution. And it's really pressure-based. So when I start to look at hydronics, when I started to get into this industry, we started talking about air separation. Immediately I said, well, geez, that's really like the bends in diving. I'm looking to separate the air out of the water. And to do that, I have to produce a bubble like it's produced when somebody gets the bend. Or you'll also hear it referred to as decompression sickness. So my lessons learned from diving that covered, carried over real well into the hydronic market is really about solubility and solubility table. If I'm going to eliminate air, I need to know where the bubbles form, and if I put my air eliminator where those bubbles are located, I can get to be an air-free system. An important lesson that uh, came from a totally separate area of my life. And the bends refer to what, Jody? You said that that name came from... Yeah, um, the actual term bends is when you look at the the decompression sickness, normally people see it or feel it in the joints of their bodies where the body bends, and that's really where that, the term the bend came from. All right, great. Yeah. So uh, another uh, thing I did over the course of my life, I spent uh, time in the Navy, uh, and as part of uh, that was a sea tour on uh, the USS Gulfin, a submarine. Now, what we're going to talk about actually is not really about the engineering side of things. It's more about the ship control side. Uh, I'm going to throw a term up there, hydrodynamics. It's really about dynamic forces. And when I look at that submarine as it moves through the water, it has a lot of similarities to how an air bubble acts in a hydronic system. Granted, it has something a little bit bigger than a, a Grunfuss 1558 pushing it along, but a lot of the forces are real similar. And what I really want to talk about is really the forces associated with velocity. It could be the velocity of the submarine moving through the water or the velocity of the water moving through a pipe. And with a submarine, I can either be what's called neutrally buoyant, neither heavy or light, positively buoyant, light like an air bubble, or negatively buoyant, heavy like dirt. The key point that I, I picked up from this that carried over into hydronics is when I start to look at velocity, I start to add speed, the dynamic forces start to pick up, and what happens is the dynamic forces can be much more strong than the force of buoyancy. For a submarine, I can keep that submarine on depth even if it's, if it's heavy or light if my dynamic forces are strong enough, and that's really through, the, through velocity. Yeah. Same thing happens with an air bubble. An air bubble has buoyancy, but if the dynamic forces in that hydronic system are strong enough, 
It won't allow the air bubbles to rise and collect and move along the top of piping. Okay. From the aspect of air elimination, it's important to know that as the velocity drops, the dynamic forces drop with it. So with a submarine, I may be able to hold up real nice running at speed, but as the submarine slows down, all of a sudden the dynamic forces drop, the buoyant forces still stay the same, and once the buoyancy becomes stronger than the dynamic, the air bubble starts to rise up. Same thing with an air bubble in a hydronic system. If I can maximize the buoyant forces versus the dynamic, then I can remove those air bubbles out of the system. And when we start to talk about air eliminators, this is actually you know, part of the discussion of how they actually work. Finally, it's really about the power of an air bubble. Um, this is what's called a, an emergency blow. Okay? Uh, if you go on YouTube, there's a couple of nice videos that are showing the entire process. But I like this picture because it shows the power of a large air bubble. It's called an emergency blow because it's done with compressed air causing the submarine to become positively buoyant. Yeah. So when I start to look at hydronic system design for air elimination, if I can increase my bubble sizes, then those larger bubbles have a higher buoyant force to them and they're much easier to, ri to have rise up in the system and separate out. Kind of summarizing this, and this will be part of a kind of an ongoing discussion through the, the course of the, the webinar, you really got to understand solubility. Because with air elimination, I have to put the, the air eliminator where the bubbles are coming out of solution. So I have to understand solubility, where the air bubbles are coming out, and this gives me the opportunity to design the best air-free system. The other thing is all about velocity. You know, velocity can mask an air problem. One thing it won't mask is noise. It will, if I have an air problem, I will hear noise from the air bubbles moving through the system. The velocity can also hinder elimination if I'm moving the water too fast for proper separation, back to those dynamic forces. And finally, when I start to look at it from an aspect of air elimination, if I can do something to increase the bubble size, it will increase the buoyancy and make it easier to do separation with, with my hydronic system. Now, when we start to talk about systems, there's a couple of systems out here. Um, for those of you that attended the uh, expansion tank copy with Coletti last summer, we talked a bit about this, but I wanted to touch on this quickly because we are talking about air elimination. Uh, from, a control, from a design standpoint, we do have what's called an air control system out there, and this is the picture on the left-hand side, and then we have air elimination, and that's the picture on the right-hand side. Now, within both of those systems, I have some sort of separation device. So if you look in the left-hand picture, in that red square, you have the air troll fitting. And that fitting is designed to separate the air bubbles of the water that's coming out of the boiler. And with air control, I'm not using an air vent to release the air bubbles. I'm directing the air bubbles back up to the compression tank. With an air control system, I don't have a pre-charge expansion tank, I have a plain steel compression tank. So I want to direct those air bubbles back up into that compression tank so that the air bubbles are adding back into the, uh, the air cushion volume within the tank itself. Now, when I do air elimination, I use a pre-charge expansion tank. It could be a diaphragm tank, it could be a bladder tank, and then it's all about once I gather the air up to use an air vent to release the air out of the, the hydronic system. This way here, I can get my system to be what's referred to as air-free, and I don't have to worry about, from that point forward, bubble formation uh, within the hydronic system. Now, when we talk about air, air is a mixture of gases, and the gases themselves each will have different um, characteristics of how they're going to affect the system performance. So I look at air. One of my two gases is oxygen. The oxygen makes up about 21% of the air's volume. Now, from a control standpoint, I guess it could be considered a good thing. When I have corrosion, the oxygen is consumed in the process. Okay? So it actually is consumed in the process when it corrodes or oxidizes material, and then the oxygen slowly goes through it way through that 
that process. Now, the other big, and this is the biggest part of the, the air in my, that's going to be in my system, is nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up about 78% of the air. Okay? Now, with nitrogen, it's an inert gas. So it's not going to combine in chemical reactions and be consumed like the oxygen would. It's inert, it stays in the system, and our goal with air elimination is I'm trying to reduce the amount of nitrogen in the system, and the goal really is to keep the nitrogen in solution, chemically locked into the water without any kind of air bubble formation. Now, the final 1% is always listed as other gases. It's a handful of other gases, all of which are inert as well, and which a lot of times what you'll see is uh, people will put charts up and they'll say air is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen, and they're just combining that remaining 1% with, uh, with the nitrogen. Now, why are we concerned with these? Let's first start off with oxygen. Okay. This is a picture directly out of uh, uh, the hydronics. Okay. I'm concerned with oxygen because I'm concerned with corrosion. So you can see in the top formula there, oxygen O2 is the first thing listed. If I look at that picture and what's coming out of that drain, you know, if you go into any boiler room, whether the system's been in operation, for four months or four years, you take a sample off the bottom of any low point in there, and you're going to have something that looks like that. To me, it looks like somebody's pouring a nice stout. It's going to be black in color, and that black in color is magnetite. It's one of my oxides of iron. So in any system, I expect to see, any system that has steel or iron components, I expect to see something like this come out of, out of the drain. If I don't add any extra air, if I don't have continuous air coming in, I consume the oxygen, I, and then I have a certain level of oxides in there. But if I continue to add air into the system, I will continue to have problems with corrosion throughout the system. I'm sure a lot of people have taken apart a cast iron boiler and saw something like this. You know, to get to this point, you've had to add additional oxygen throughout the life of the system to, to generate this level of corrosion. But with oxygen, corrosion is part of the equation of what we have to pay attention to. It's about the iron oxide coating out on the rotors of ECM-driven pumps. It's about the corrosion of iron-based components throughout the system. So when we start to look at eliminating air, I can eliminate air, I can reduce and control the amount of corrosion that's in my system. Now, let's talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen's inert, it's not going to react. With nitrogen, it's all about, the problems are all about when it comes out of solution. So on the top there, it says radiator is partially heating or not heating. Figure 5.2 shows a radiator. If it's partially full of air, then the radiator is not going to be full of water and radiating heat into the building. Uh, when I put a panel radiator into one of the rooms in my house, how I knew it was time to vent the radiator is I put my hand on that radiator and felt, felt right across it. And as I went from one corner to the other, it would go from barely able to touch it hot to comfortable to put your hand on on the other corner. And I knew that there was there's an air pocket sitting inside there because the full radiator was not radiating. The other thing that can happen is I can have air-bound or air-trapped zones throughout my system. Figure 9 on the bottom there, that the way it's drawn out, it shows some nice trapping points where the flow goes up, across, and then back down again. If I have air, an air problem where my nitrogen is coming out of solution, it can sit there as an air pocket. And if I have something like this here where a single pump is pumping into four zone valve zones, parallel zones, all of a sudden, this air pocket can either reduce the flow rate through that individual zone or cut it off completely. It's a no-heat call. So from the aspect of nitrogen, I have to take care of it from a performance standpoint. Now, last month, uh, John Siegenthaler did a great job doing a coffee with Kalefi about pumping. Yeah. Part of his discussion was about cavitation. So I'm going to probably try and get on 
some of the high points. I highly recommend if you haven't attended that car food collection, you go back and take a look at that one and also its predecessor that he did for us back in December as well. But what happens is how that circulator is going to move water through the system is the pressure drops in the eye of the pump, and then as it makes its way through the spinning impeller moving outward, the pressure is, increases. So if I have an air problem in the system, as the water enters, that low pressure can cause the air to come out of solution as a bubble. And then as that bubble travels up the impeller, the pressure increases and the bubble collapses. You know, some people use that, actually use the term implosion. Okay? Now what happens is when that bubble implodes, it could, um, it'll cause noise. It will also, if it's bad enough where I have a lot of cavitation, the pump's performance suffers because of the, the fact that it's moving air rather than moving water. The, in that small implosion or that collapsing of the bubble also will impinge on the rotor causing pitting or even, you know, part of the rotor to start to be uh, essentially eaten away in the process. And additionally, that implosion will move the impeller, which can give us problems with the bearings and also the pump seal. So there's a lot of reasons why, from the pump cavitation side, I want to have a good handle on the air in my, my hydronic system. Now... I want to get rid of the air. It's a matter of how do I do it. Getting rid of air really is a, uh, a two-stage process. It's about purging and it's about separation. Purging is getting rid of the air as you're filling the system up. I want to remove any kind of trapped air pockets. In an ideal world, when I start to separate, all I'm trying to do is getting wor working with the water excuse me, the air that's in solution in the water of the system. If I don't do a good job purging, then I also have to, then when I'm doing my separation, get rid of the air that exists in standing pockets throughout the system as I'm moving the, the water around the system. Now, purging, good purging doesn't happen by accident. You have to plan to purge. Um, you know, over the course of, uh, of my, the years that I've been working in the hydronics industry, you know, I've had different uh, positions where part of what I did was offer technical support. And whenever somebody said that they had an air problem in the system and I tried to help them, I used to cringe when I asked them how many valves they had in the system and the answer either were valves or a number that I could probably count on one here. Purging is all about dividing the system up and doing it essentially a loop by loop. I can't purge two parallel flow paths. One path will purge very nicely, the other one will have air problems. So it's all about purge valves and isolation valves. Isolate everything but a single loop, so here that last zone with the zone valve on the end, excuse me, is the one that I'm purging. I bring water in through my fill valve, up through the loop, and then down out the purge valve, and either into a bucket or a um, down the drain. And from this aspect, it's really okay. I flush it till I have a nice solid stream of water. I know I have the air out. I shut that one down. I leave, I isolate it, and then move on. And if I do this right, at the very end, I've removed all the static pockets of air, and now when I start to look at air separation, I'm just worried about the air that's in solution in the water itself. Now, with this, with purging, purging from the bottom of the system, it's all about velocity. Remember back to that discussion about dynamic forces. I have to make sure I'm moving that water fast enough that the, the water will be able to entrain or drag the air down to the bottom of the system. It has to have enough velocity. Oh, what's considered enough? Okay. Here's a, uh, a chart that's, uh, again, out of the hydronics. It looks at various tubing sizes, and it lists a minimum and a maximum flow rate. From the aspect of entraining or dragging the air along, I like to focus on that minimum column. 
that minimum flow rate of two feet per second, and it lists the j gallons per minute. You know, that number of two feet per second I've sh seen in a couple locations. Um, another great air elimination reference, if you can find one, is uh, Amtro at one point it put out a um, an engineering handbook. I have a copy of it on my desk. It's wide open right now. It's dated 1977. But that manual has a lot of good information. And generally in there, for instance, it says your flow rate should be in the vicinity of one and a half to do two GPM to entrain air. So when I start to look at some of my larger pipe sizes, then I'm going to jump up and say, well, what if I'm doing a two-inch pipe? That two-inch pipe, it's calling for a flow rate of almost 20 GPM to entrain the air, a little bit on the high side. So generally, the method of purging from the bottom, using velocity to bring the water back down and purging it out, works well residentially in your smaller pipe sizes. But when I start to look at larger systems, commercial systems, all of a sudden I have to look at a different approach because it becomes very difficult with just using street pressure and the available valving to, uh, to get rid of the air. It's about high point vents. So when I'm purging with a large system, I need high point vents either automatic or manual, to remove the air pockets. I fill from the bottom up, and as I'm filling up, the, the trapped air is released out of the vent, and when I have water at the vent, I've removed the standing pockets. I think, Jody, what you told me yesterday, you said it takes about two feet per second to move a half-inch size air bubble through a piping system, whether it's three-quarter, one-inch, or whatever it is. And the key there is with a fill valve, we're not going to get that kind of velocity in a larger pipe system. So you're either going to need a pump or you're going to need another way to, you know, try and get the air out of the top of the system and then let the uh, separator do its job from there, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that number is, um, again, it's from the, the Amtral Engineering Handbook. One of the numbers that they had in there was if I have, say, a half-inch diameter air bubble, it takes about 1.5 feet per second to entrain that air bubble. Yep. I'm actually going to go back a slide. And if you look at um, most fill valves, you know, our fill valve, we're at about 5.3 GPM. Yeah. If I look at uh, one-inch copper, I'm just about at the point where I can generate enough velocity through the, through the fill valve to entrain the air and take the, you know, and purge the air out of a, of, out of a system with one-inch piping. Once I get beyond there, then my velocities just aren't sufficient to entrain the air and, and move it to the bottom of the system. That's the key, yep. Now, question always comes up about how many vents do I need in the system? Uh, I've seen buildings that have had a single air vent in the system. I've seen buildings with you know, 20, 30 air vents. It's all about where is the air going to get trapped in the system. You know, do I need vents on risers? It may be manual or automatic vents on panel radiators or radiators. You know, in solar, I need a vent at the top of the system. Hydraulic separator, air vent on the top of that, uh, a buffer tank, radiant manifolds, possibly an L a T elbow, uh, I mean, a a vent elbow at the, on a, a run in the uh, fin tube baseboard. But depending on the system, you may find that you can get away with one on a small residential system, but as the systems become larger and more complicated, more air vents are going to be needed throughout that system to, uh, to ensure I get all of the air out. Yeah. So automatic air vents are not air separators. They're there to remove stationary pockets of air. Design-wise, most of the vents out there are what's called a float-type vent. Inside you have a float, and as the air vent fills with air, the float drops through the lever arm. It will open the vent against the spring pressure up here in the cap. Okay. Now, design-wise, there's three things that have to be considered when selecting an air vent. I'm actually going to start at the bottom and work my way to the top. Max operating pressure. What's the pressure rating of the, the air vent? 
Do I need a, a 60 pound, a 75, 150 PSI rated air vent? Now, so the air vent's going to be rated like every other component as far as in the system, as far as the maximum pressure it can, it's designed to withstand. The discharge capacity is how much air in cubic feet per minute the air vent is going to uh, let out. Now, the interesting one is what's called the venting pressure. And the venting pressure really is under what operating conditions the air vent will vent air. Because when somebody looks at an air vent, they look at this picture, they think it's a, it's a real simple uh, process. I have the spring that holds the vent shut. The float has weight in it, weight to it. If the float drops to its lever arm, it's going to open up the uh, the valve by overcoming the spring tension. Now, in reality, there's a third component that has to be considered. There, the force of the system, the pressure within the the the, the air vent itself is help holding that vent shut. Now, so it has a surface area. So if I have a certain PSI pounds per square inch inside the system, and that air vent has a certain square inch surface area, there's a force holding that thing closed. So when I start looking at the maximum venting pressure, I will actually get air out of it when the weight of the float provides a force greater than the force provided by the spring pressure plus the force of the system pressure within the system pushing up on that air vent. So an air vent may, you know, I may have an air vent that has a a maximum operating, um, a maximum venting pressure of 40 psi. If I run that system at 50 or 60 psi, that air vent can fill with air, but between the spring pressure and the system pressure on the valve, that valve is going to stay closed, even though that vent is full of air. So it is something to consider, particularly when I'm looking at doing larger commercial applications that the system may be five, six, seven feet tall and the air vents are in the bottom of the system. Okay. Now, in my travels talking to engineers and large mechanicals, usually there's a couple of things that end up as pushbacks about using automatic air vents. Now, it usually starts with the comment, every air vent leaks. And from that, I want to talk about a couple of things that can be done to help on the air vent side of things. It's what's called, one of them is called a hydroscopic cap, and the other is called a service check. Okay? Now, a, a lot of times these air vents end up in high points throughout the building where if the air vent leaks water, there's going to be damage. Could be flooring, could be the ceiling, could be a number of different locations. And so usually you'll hear, well, I either, I'll hear either the, um, I don't use automatic air vents, I do manual air vents, or when I have the system up and operating, I close the cap just in case. This hydroscopic cap, if you look at the drawing off to the right-hand side, it has a series of wafers. These wafers, when they get wet, swell and close off. So it's a secondary uh, shutdown on the air vent. So if I put that hydroscopic cap in there, I don't have to worry about water getting anywhere. If something gets stuck under the seat of the air vent, the hydroscopic cap is going to prevent water from coming out. Okay. Now, the service check works in the op and a little bit different from the aspect of the value it brings. Now, a lot of guys will say, I, um, I have all the caps tightened down because I cannot repair the, the air vent. I didn't put an isolation valve in there, and I don't want to shut my system down just to take the air vent out. The service check, um, I always think of it as an isolation base. I back the, the air vent out, the service check goes closed, allows me to pull that air vent out, disassemble, service the air vent, and put it back in while maintaining pressure and operation of the system. So to me, these two, these two options on air vents take away a lot of the... Um, the the opposition to using automatic air vents and systems. And personally, and later on we're going to talk a little bit more about it, personally I think most systems out there still need automatic air vents because of uh, the way technology has gone. 
Let me throw in a third one there, too, Jody. We do make an adapter um, for the top of that air vent if you want to put a copper tube on it and take it down to the floor, down to a drain. I know some, in fact, I think the, one of the excellent uh, entries last month uh, above the IBC boilers, he had little copper tubes on, uh, connected to every one of his air vents because that was on top of the boiler. The boiler manufacturer wants it there, but, um, you know, knowing that someday that could leak just by putting a little copper tube down to the floor, down to a drain would also uh, make you sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Bob. That's, that's a great point. So, the air vents will get rid of static pockets of air. You know, they don't go in there and they don't work with that, the, the entrained air moving along and being able to separate the entrained air from the water flow. So we're going to figure out how to do that. The first thing is I have to figure out where the air bubbles are going to be located. You know, it's all about dissolved air. So the air is dissolved in the water. Physically, I look at it, there's no air bubbles present. Usually when we talk about air, we'll talk about solubility and how much air as a percentage of the total volume. It could be expressed as a, a strict uh, percentage number, 2.5%, 3%, or you'll often hear it referred in as uh, the water has the ability to hold 1.5 gallons of air per 100 gallons of water. Again, another way of talking about the percentage of the volume. Now, when we look at charts and we talk about air from the aspect of, in, of air elimination, what we're actually looking at is the maximum solubility of the water. And that's the maximum point. That tells me the, the absolute maximum amount of air that the water can hold under those conditions. And the conditions we look at are temperature and pressure. Now, when we start to look at air elimination, air bubbles form when I have more air present than the water can hold. So I've essentially exceeded the maximum solubility of the water. The excess air then will be released as air bubbles, and that's what I want to get rid of. Now, again, another great chart out of Hydronics 15. And it looks at the relationship between solubility, pressure, and temperature. The scale up the right, the upside is maximum amount of, in gallons of dissolved air per 100 gallons of water. Across the bottom is temperature, and then the curves, the red curves are all based on the pressure. So let's take a look at how this works. And again, you have quick numbers of quick trending. When I look at pressure, the higher the pressure, the more air I can hold into the solution. When I look at temperature, it's inverse. The higher the temperature, the less air I can hold in solution. So from a starting point, let's start at that first dot that just came on there. 30 PSI in 65 degree water. So in the world of residential hydronics, that's a fairly high pressure and a fairly low temperature. If I look off to the side, the max solubility is 3.6%. So that's the absolute, or 3.6 gallons per 100 gallons. That's the absolute maximum amount of air that I can hold in that water. Okay. It may have it. It may have less air. If there is more air, I have bubbles present. Look what happens when I change temperature. So I'm going to go from 65 degrees up to 170. I slide down the 30 PSI curve, and I end up at 1.8 gallons per 100 gallons of water. I've cut my, my ability to hold air in solution. I essentially cut it in half. So if, right, if at, when I was at, at 65 degrees Fahrenheit, if that water, say, was holding 3.5, 3, 2.5, 2 gallons of air, what now happens is all of a sudden, when I drop, when I raise that temperature, bubbles start to form. The water can no longer hold that extra air. It's topped out at 1.8 gallons per 100 gallons. Now, let's drop pressure. Let's drop it from 30 PSI to 15. I drop down to 15. My 1.8 gallons per 100 gallons now is down to 0.6 gallons per 100 gallons. I cut it to a third. Again, as I make my way down, if I have more than 0.6 gallons of air per 100 gallons in my system, all of a sudden I'm going to see bubble formation because my water has lost the ability to hold air in solution. Okay. 
Now, when I look at a hydronic system, this is happening all the time. I heat the system up, I cool the system down. From our expansion tank discussion, I may put the expansion tank in and it's pre-charged 12 PSI. When the system's at temperature, the pressure may go all the way up to 20 PSI. I have static pressure. My system may be 12 PSI in the basement. It might be 5 PSI in the top of the building. My circulator generates head pressure. That's added pressure over the static pressure. So you have a very dynamic situation where that solubility of the water as it moves around the system is constantly changing. And the key is, in that system, there's going to be one combination of temperature and pressure that's going to represent the lowest solubility. And that's, think of it as the first place see air bubbles in the last place to see air bubbles as things are changing. So that's where I want to put my air, my air eliminator because I want to make sure that I pick up the very last air bubble that will come out of solution in my system. So how do we do that? Well, we have air with dissolved water. Excuse me, uh, water with uh, dissolved air in it. First thing we need to look at is how do I find my lowest solubility? It's about pressure and temperature. If I choose the right combination, my dissolved air now becomes a trained micro air bubble. Once I have those micro air bubbles, they're small, they're subjected to all the velocity and the dynamic moving around, it makes them very hard to separate, so I have to have a way to get it in the format that the bubbles will make their way up to an air vent. So in a bit, we're going to talk about air eliminators. From our aspect, we use velocity and a coalescing media to change my small micro, my entrained air micro bubbles to a stationary air pocket within my air eliminator. Once I have a stationary air pocket, I can get rid of the air with an air vent. Again, going back to the information from uh, Hydronics 15. So I can look at any hydronic system, whether it's heating or cooling, and take a look at the conditions in various points around the system, and I'm looking at it from the aspect of pressure and temperature. So for instance, at point A, on the outlet of the boiler, I have 20 PSI and I have 170 degrees. I can plot that over on my chart. You know, I can do the same for point B, point C, and point D. And when I have them all on the chart, my air eliminator needs to go at the position where the solubility is lowest. So if I look at those four points, you notice point A is the lowest of the three dots on the chart. It's about, a, let's call it um, two, and a, two and a quarter, 2.25 gallons of air per 100 gallons of water. So that tells me that that's where I want to put my air eliminator because that's going to be the place where air comes out of solution most readily. And additionally, as the solubility changes, that's going to be the last place that I'm going to see air coming out of solution. So I want to take that very last bit of air out. You know, this is why when you talk to somebody about their systems and air elimination, they say, oh, yeah, I, I use an air eliminator. I put it between the boiler and the pump, and it makes the system air-free. Now, from a design standpoint, that's the right answer for residential applications and for all applications. That's probably the right answer for 90% of what we build and design in, 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 in our industry. Now, there are, there's the other 10% to consider. Okay. What do I mean by the other 10%? It's all of a sudden when you start to look at a taller buildings. And when I get in with an engineering group and we start to talk about air elimination, and usually, you know, some of the more senior guys are like, so Jody, does everything, does it always go like that? Boiler, air eliminator, circulator. And my answer always is, depends. Tell me how tall your building is. Because all of a sudden, when I start to get to a taller building, pressure now becomes more of a contributor to the solubility. For our, our example, let's say I have a building that's about seven stories tall. A seven-story building, I'm going to generate about 
35 psi of static pressure. Depending on the, the space between the floors, you know, that number could vary a little bit. I like to keep things simple, so we're going to go with 35. Additionally, I'm going to run five pounds of positive pressure on my system. So if I look at the pressure at the bottom of the building, I'm looking at 40 psi. Now, on the top floor of that building, in a static condition, I just have my five pounds of positive pressure. I have to also account for the, the, head, the head pressure of my pump minus the, the loss is getting there. So let's say that point is halfway around the loop. And again, to keep my numbers easy, I'm going to say the pump generates the equivalent of 10 PSI of head pressure. So let's cut that in half and call it 5. So I have 5 of static, 5 of head pressure. I put a gauge there while it's running. I see 10 PSIG. So 10 at the top, 40 at the, the bottom of the building. Okay. Now, I'm going to go old school and say I'm running that's, that I'm going to run at a 20 degree delta T and that's the end of my loop. So I'm going to look at points A and C here. A is in the basement of the building. C is on the top floor, that seventh story, just before I draw it back down to the the mechanical room. If you look at this A, I'm running at 3.78 gallons per 100 gallons, gallons of air per 100 gallons of water in the system. At the top of the building, I'm running at 1.7 gallons per 100 gallons. So in this instance, the point of low solubility actually is not down in the mechanical room. It's on the top floor of the building. Sometimes pressure has a greater influence than temperature. So from a design standpoint, actually the best location for the air eliminator is really on the top floor of that building, not down in the mechanical room. Okay. Now, where on the top floor? It really depends. It's, it varies application to application. You know, what's the static pressure in the system? What's the head pressure generated in the pump plus where, how much friction loss between the pump and where I am in my system itself? What's the operating temperature of the system? What's my delta T I'm running? There's a lot of things that play into it. But when I'm doing larger buildings, I can't just default and say the air eliminator is going down at the ground floor in the mechanical room between the pump, between the boiler and the pump. There's a little bit of play in that that has to be accounted for. You know, when somebody says a tall building, you know, my question always is, hey, can we do a penthouse boiler room? You know, that way there I have all the equipment up there and the, the air eliminator ends up in the same location as it would down in the basement between the boiler and the circulator of the system. You now the penthouse boiler room actually has a lot of other things going for it, such as the the, uh, the expansion tank is much smaller on the top of the building than it would be seven stories down. My makeup air, my venting, a lot of other things come into play that makes for a nice install at the top. But uh, when you're doing a tall building, you know, I always say, well, give it a shot. See if we can we can get that penthouse boiler room and uh, get all the equipment up there with the air eliminator. Lower pressure boiler, too. Uh, and well, your boiler also, is, you know, you can run at a much lower pro pressure. And when we start talking about 40 PSI, some of the residential guys are saying, probably saying, well, what about that 30-pound relief valve? Typically, when you're in that commercial boiler market, I would say most of the boilers generally are at least a 75 PSI boiler. And I think what you're seeing on the commercial side, more and more manufacturers are actually coming out with 150 PSI boilers as well. Okay. So... I'm purging the air out. I now know where to put my air eliminator. So now it's a matter of how does the air eliminator actually get rid of the air. Depends on the style of air eliminator that uh, we're dealing with. Okay. Let's start off with the, the old standby, the air scoop. It seems like they've been around forever. Okay, so the air scoop, if you look at the drawing, there's a series of veins or in the air scoop and the idea is the air scoop, the volume is opening up, which does drop the velocity slightly. So they are doing, they're helping, they're having velocity help a little bit. But the idea is the, the bubbles are going to be riding close to the upper half of the pipe, and the air scoop is going to allow those bubbles to gather and collect in the top of the air scoop. 
couple of things about this operation of the air scoop. Um, in order for it to be effective, and this is in a couple of manufacturers' installation instructions, I need 18 pipe diameters, not 18 inches, because you'll hear that every once in a while. It's actually written 18 pipe diameters of straight horizontal run of pipe before the uh, the purger to get the the for the purger to be effective. It's all about trying to clean up the turbulent flow that will allow the air bubbles to migrate or drift to the top end of the pipe. Okay. So if I put that purger in there, if I come elbow, you know, close nipple purger, there's a lot of turbulence and it does ruin the efficiency or the effectiveness of this purger. Um, the other thing is when you start to look at micro bubbles, the very small bubbles, that purger doesn't open up enough to drop down the velocity to separate the small micro bubbles. So we're talking about the little tiny bubbles that you see, and we'll use the beer analogy. You open up a beer, it sits there for a while, and you see these little tiny, tiny bubbles, you know, smaller than a millimeter, that lazily drift their way up in the beer. You know, those kind of little air bubbles won't separate in this kind of purger. I mean, you look at the purger, it might be six inches long. If I'm flowing through there, starting at 4 GPM, excuse me, 4 feet per second, and in that purger I might drop down to close to 2, still that doesn't give the small bubbles ample opportunity to rise up and separate out. So there is a couple of things to think about with those air purgers or air scoops. Now, with that being said, uh, I often get asked about uh, different technologies matching with different products. And here I say old school versus new school. Air purgers coupled with low mass condensing boilers. These low mass condensing boilers have a low volume and a, and a fairly high velocity usually passing through them. The boilers technology, I usually say uh, try and move to one, um, a coalescing technology to separate the air because the, the, the condensing boiler really doesn't form air bubbles like a purger needs to remove. You know, high velocities inside there, the bubbles don't grow. They're typically coming out just as these micro bubbles. So it's very difficult in separation when I get to a purger, and it seems like the, the air problem tends to stick around for a while. Now, I also have it in there. It's also compounded if you're over pumping. You know, the purge is designed to work, at, uh, I want to say, at a velocity of about four feet per second coming in. If you're flowing faster, it makes the air purger even less effective. Where do purges normally show up? It's about cast iron boilers. Now, a cast iron or a steel boiler, you have large water content and large water passageways through the boiler. The boiler effectively becomes a coalescing area for the bubbles. The bubbles form, the bubbles grow in size, so that when they exit the boiler, the bubbles are a sufficient diameter that the mechanism that working inside that air purger will separate the bubbles out. So air purgers, cast iron boilers, good combination. Air purgers, condensing boilers, I'd say look for other technology. Now, commercially, another technology out there is the tangential air separator. They get their name by the fact that if you look at the, the body of it, you look down from the top at the, the air separator, the piping connectors aren't directly in line on the center line of the air separator. They're offset so that they come onto the body on a tangent. They're, you know, they almost come in equal with the, the side of the, the air separator. Now, what this tangential connection does is as it enters into the body, it creates a circular motion with the water, a rotating motion inside the separator. Okay? It works by centrifugal force. The water is heavier than the air bubbles. Through the centrifugal force, the air bubbles will migrate. Because of the water being pushed to the outside, the lighter air bubbles will be essentially forced into the center of the vortex. You'll see how that refers to a lot by the, the tangential air separator people. Forced into the vortex in the middle of the separator. In that center area, the velocities are very low. And with this low velocity, allows the air bubbles to rise up through buoyancy and uh, are vented out through. So it's another technology out there, primarily a commercial technology. Now, the technology that uh, our separators work off of is called a coalescing air separator. 
kind of brings into it a couple of things that we talked about earlier on. So first off, an air, a larger air bubble has more buoyant forces to make it rise up and gather into the top of the air separator. That's where the coalescing media comes in. So the media has sharp or well-defined edges, and what we're counting on is these small micro bubbles impinging on the media. They'll impinge and they, they will impinge and they will adhere to the, the that, that well-defined surface of the media. Now, once it adheres on there, the buoyancy may not be enough to force it up into the top, but it, its adherence is enough to, so it won't shear off because of the water movement. What coalescing means is as it's passing through, as more air hit and impinge, the bubbles coalesce or grow in size. As the bubble gets bigger, its buoyancy becomes stronger, and it starts to make its way up the structure of the coalescing media. By the time buoyancy takes over and it shears off of the media, it's now in the upper half of it, and it won't be swept out. So we're using the fact that I can grow, I can use this to grow the bubble to a large enough diameter that buoyancy will ensure it doesn't get swept out of the, the air separator. Now, the other thing that we have working for us is velocity. If you look at the body of a coalescing air separator, you'll notice the body usually runs to be about three times the diameter of the incoming pipe. By opening up the diameter, I'm significantly reducing the velocity. I reduce the velocity, all of a sudden it allows buoyancy to help bring the bubbles up higher in the, the coalescing air separator. So with this style of separator, we utilize a coalescing media, we utilize velocity. And by that combination, we're now able to attack the micro bubbles and get the micro bubbles out of the, the water flow and separate them from the system. Now, if I'm doing primary secondary, my preference is to do a hydraulic separator. It simplifies the install and it gives me good consistent performance and hydraulically separates both sides of my, my heating system. Now, additionally, where the hydraulic separator goes is the best location for my air elimination. More and more, we're seeing people shift over residentially to our SEP4, which has four-in-one functionality. And the nice thing about the SEP4 is it doesn't, you know, most of your hydraulic separators out there, the air elimination really is about velocity. I drop the velocity, and if it drops low enough, the bubbles will rise up inside the hydraulic separator. With the SEP4, we have a coalescing media. So it's as effective as our discal uh, air separator. So it does air separation. It's designed by purpose. But it also does dirt separation. It also does hydraulic separation. And it also has a band in the bottom for magnetic separation. So I'm taking care of the oxidation that occurs because my um, because of the fact that the air in my system is going to have oxygen, I'm going to have a certain level of corrosion, iron oxide, that I have to take care of. The SEP4 helps us on that end as well. Jody, one of the things that's becoming really common in uh, hydronic systems these days is the uh, variable speed pumping that we're using, whether it's a delta P or a delta T pump, where there's conditions where we might be lowering that uh, velocity through the system below two feet per second. And, you know, if you follow some of the online chat rooms, people say, gosh, my system's been quiet, working fine all, all winter, and all of a sudden it's starting to get noisy. That coupled with these outdoor reset controls where the boiler temperature starts to go up as the, the temperatures outside most of the nation right now drop and, and those operating temperatures go up, that air is now coming out that hasn't had a chance to come out when it's running that lower temperature in that boiler. So they say, well, why is it all of a sudden the problem with air locks and noise in my system when it's been fine all winter? And that's, that's another thing that we have to be concerned about is when we start dropping velocities down with variable speed pumping and we start putting our boilers where the temperature changes you know, as the weather gets colder, that makes that whole solubility thing more of a, of a concern and uh, you have to pay more attention to uh, the device and where you're getting your air out of your system and how you're getting it out. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, in a, in a few slides, we're actually going to talk about uh, how outdoor reset affects air elimination. So oh, okay. actually, good, very good. Great, great lead in. All right. Now, <laughs> remember you have to. Hey, yes. Now, a lot of times everybody asks about air separation in chilled water. 
you know, because if I fill the system up, they're thinking it's chilled water. I'm just going to drop the temperature of the water. The solubility is going to increase, and air is not going to be a problem. Um, I'm first going to look at installations where it's chilled water only. So something that, for instance, has a four-pipe system like you see here. I like to see an air separator because of the amount of piping that exists within the building envelope. So when I go to turn that chilled water system on, the entire, all that piping that's within the building envelope may be at 60, 65, 70 degrees temperature, significantly higher than the temperature that I fill that system up with. So I like to see the air separator to ensure that the, the chilled water system, I'm not going to have a, an air problem after I start that system up and the, all the water in the system has been heated during the, the heating side of the season. Now, a little bit different than a boiler with, a strict, with just a chiller in that the, the higher water temperatures on the inlet, so my expectation is on the inlet of the chiller, you have what you see here, a circulator and then my air eliminator. That way there, I'm, I'm going to hit my point of low solubility at that location. I put it there, I, I remove all the air, my system becomes air free. But I still like to see a, uh, an air eliminator in the chiller even though the temperature is going down. Sometime during the course of the season, on the off seasons, I'm going to see higher water temperatures that potentially could let air out of solution. Okay. Now, if I have a reverse cycle chiller, heating and cooling, air elimination in a heating mode is my biggest concern. So that air eliminator will be in the system on the outlet of the reverse cycle chiller like it would be on the boiler. So I can remove the air as the water is heated in a heating mode. Okay. So from the aspect of air elimination, it's about solubility. It's about finding the lowest point of solubility for the system. It's putting the air elimination device in that location, separating the air bubbles out, you know, using velocity, using coalescing to make the bubbles bigger, and generating an air-free system. Now, a couple of other things that I do want to talk about, and I know we're getting a little bit tight on time on the end here, so Bob's going to have to talk fast after I finish, is a couple of things from a procedural standpoint. Okay? The system only is at as an air-free system when the system gets to design temperature, of temp of temperature and pressure. And the question always comes up is really it's a startup question. Is your system, did you bring that system up to design conditions on startup? Did you achieve the design water temperature? If not, as the water temperature starts to increase, the system is going to continually let out air. Because the system is not going to be air free until it's at, at design temperature. If the answer is no, please use automatic air vents and make sure you don't tighten the cap on the vent. A couple of things that make this something that has to be planned on. It's really part of it's where the boiler industry is going. Yeah. A lot of, you know, we're shifting mainly to condensing boilers. Not just wall hungs, but boilers in the 3, 4, 5 million BTU range. And they all seem to have a premixed burner. Okay. Now, the premix burner is a lot different than a linkage-style modulating burner. Okay? With a linkage burner, you're setting a number of points on that burner, and it, takes, it could take a long period of time to dial it in. We're talking about at least an hour or so. It could be longer, depending on the manufacturer's burner. With premix, the burner is normally pre-fired at the factory, you know, so you're not spending a lot of time bringing it from just a in-the-box generic setting to where you need to be, but it's, you're starting up pretty close to where you should be. And the other thing is it has linear response. I'm worried about high fire, I'm worried about low fire, and then it operates linearly between the two. So I'm not setting individual points, I'm just setting the end. It can be a very quick startup. I've known guys that have done commercial boiler startups on pre-mixed burners where the actual burner startup time is measured in minutes, not hours. Okay? What this means from a startup standpoint is with a linkage burner, where I have, say I got two, three, four boilers, when, it's just when I start to set those boilers up, I have to reject heat so the system is running. 
It would lend itself, whereas by the time I finished most cases, the system is already up to design conditions. You didn't have to write that into the startup spec. With premix burners, when I finish, the water temperature might be in the 100 degree range. There's plenty of dissolved air that will still be released during the course of the heating season, so I have to account for that. The other thing that works against me is, from an air elimination standpoint, is outdoor recess, if I don't achieve design conditions. Okay? With outdoor recess, every time I hit a new colder day, the water temperature starts to creep up. Today was a cold day. I got to here. The next day is colder. I'm five degrees higher. The next day is colder. I'm five degrees higher. Every time I hit a new high temperature, I hit a new point of low solubility. The system is letting out air continuously. So from the aspect of air elimination, the air is not eliminated until I get to the coldest day, the design day of the year. It could be even the colder day. For instance, here in Rhode Island, you know, we were down in the negative numbers, which is significantly below my design day. So, you know, I didn't even go down to check it, but my boiler may have let out some air. My, my, my might have hit a new point of low solubility this week and never even knew about it. But it has to be considered because of the fact the system's not air-free until I hit those design conditions. Let's put in the automatic air vents. Let's not tighten the cover down. Let's, let's let them do their job taking that air out of the system. And also now, sure one more slide. Is that make, sure, make sure water goes in behind it. If you're going to let air out at those higher temperatures, you've got to replace it, or you're going to have a low uh, pressure condition, mm -hmm. possibly. So. Yeah, ex absolutely. Now, I have to throw this out here because of the fact that, you know, it sounds a lot of negative, but I want you to let know that the system is trying to help you out. Again, this is actually out of um, the engineering handbook by Amtrol. And when we talk about solubility, normally we look at the solubility of air. Um, here, I, there's a couple of charts that actually look at the solubility of out nitrogen. And if I look at this here, this chart here says nitrogen, 79% of dry gas. So this is looking at day one, I fill it up, there's air, and in my air there's oxygen and nitrogen. Under these conditions, you see here at 170 degrees, 10 PSI, I have, let's round it up, let's call it one gallon of air per 100 gallons is my low solubility point. What's interesting is as time goes on, the oxygen is consumed in corrosion, and now my dissolved air is essentially 100% nitrogen. So if I look at those exact same conditions at 100% nitrogen, I now pick up the ability to hold essentially a quarter gallon more air per 100 gallons. So my solubility number, my maximum solubility went up, and, and it went up because the oxygen content went down in the water. So the system does help you a little bit. And this is also why you might have run across the system, you hear some air noise as you're starting it up, but you come back in a few weeks and the air noise all went away. The solubility changed as the composition of your air changed due to corrosion consuming the oxygen. So, covered a lot of ground. I've actually, we're now in the process of going over. Um, we talked about air elimination. We talked about solubility. We talked about velocity and turbulence and how all of that works in there. You know, we talked about what the, the issues that come up with corrosion and we talked about how to get rid of the air. Are there any questions? Yeah, there are, Jody, but I think we better uh, answer them after the, the gig here because we want to hit on our, uh, our contest winner and stuff. Okay. This month, so. All right. So that, was, well, I know that, well, well. that was a lot of information to get through. Um, as usual, at the end of this, if you stay on for a minute and take the survey, if you want this uh, certificate, it'll, it'll stay, of course, stay in touch with us, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, however you'd like to communicate. We'd love to hear from you, good or bad. So. Uh, Keep in touch, and um, 